All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Committee on Land Use. I am Councilmember Rafael Salamanca. I am the chair of this committee. I would like to uh, welcome my esteemed colleagues who are members of this committee who are present here today. We have Council Members Traeger, Miller, Diaz, Rivera, Ku, Chin, Chair Adams, Richards, Lansman, Barry Gudenchik, Deutsch, Espinal, and Antonio Reynoso. I want to thank Chair Moya and Chair Adams for their work on our land use subcommittees. Today we will be voting on a number of projects referred out of our subcommittees, and after that we will hold a public hearing on intro 1058. If you are here to testify on intro 1058, please fill out a speaker's slip with the sergeant at arms. Today we will vote to approve with modifications pre-considered numbers 436 and 437 for the two Howard Avenue rezoning in council member Ampre Samuels district in Brooklyn. The project area will be rezoned from an R6B slash C2-4 district to a C4-4L district. A related zoning tax amendment to map the site as a mandatory inclusionary housing area will be modified to remove option two requiring the use of MIH option one or the, or the added deep affordability option. We will also be voting to approve the modifications pre considered as LUs 420 through 423, the special Bay Street Corridor dis District rezoning in Council Member Rose District in Staten Island. The special Bay Street Corridor rezoning proposal would rezone approximately 20 blocks in the area of downtown Staten Island near the St. George, Stapleton, and Tom. Kinsville neighborhoods to require conceptual buildings and new affordable housing and to promote economic development. The actions are a zoning map change, a zoning tax amendment, a UDAP designation and dispositions. The council will be modifying the zoning tax application LU421 in response to concerns voiced by community members regarding the urban design of anticipated new development. By requiring building heights in certain areas to be more consistent with the existing character of the area and to accommodate public schools. The council will also remove mandatory inclusion mandatory inclusionary housing option two and the workforce option. MIH option one and the deep affordability option, which together require the deepest affordability possible will apply. With regards to LU423, the proposed UDAP disposition, the council notes that HPD has submitted a revised project summary for the future development of the disposition site at 539 Jersey Street. This ensures that the site will be developed with a residential component of approximately 223 units that would be 100% affordable and include and option for the set aside for affordable senior housing. I would like to congratulate Councilmember Rose, who has dedicated countless hours with the administration and stakeholders to achieve the best possible outcome for our community. We will vote to approve the modification LUs 424 through 427, the Brook 156th Street rezoning in my district in the Bronx. The proposal includes a zoning map change to rezone an existing R7-2 district to a C6-2 district. A zoning tax amendment to map the site as a mandatory inclusionary housing area with MIH option one and MIH option two. Approval for this position of city-owned property and a special permit to allow the development on or over a rail yard right away. These actions will facilitate the development of a new nine-story mixed-use building with approximately 54 affordable housing apartments, community facility space, and open space. We will be striking MIH option two and requiring compliance with MIH option one. From our landmark subcommittees, we will be voting to approve four site selections for new schools. Application 2018531, SCK is for an approximately 650 seat intermediate school to be located in Councilmember Menchaca's district in Brooklyn. Application 2018533, SCX, is for an approximately 458-seat primary school to be located in my district in the Bronx. Application 2019-5177, SCX, is an application for approximately 458-seat primary school in Councilmember Gibson's district, also in the Bronx. Application 2019-5464, SCK, is for an approximately 592 seat intermediate school in council member Brandon's district in Brooklyn. We will also vote to approve five applications, LUs 398 through 402, submitted by HPD pursuant to Article 16 of the General Municipal Law for approval of an urban development area project and waivers of the area designation requirements and of, of Charter Section 197-C and 197-D, and pursuant to Article 11 of the Private Housing Finance Laws for exemptions for, from real property taxes. LUs 398, the East Harlem El Barrio Community Land Trust will facilitate the rehabilitation 
of affordable housing in four city-owned buildings in Councilmember Ayala and Councilmember Perkins District in Manhattan. LUS 399, the Lenox Avenue cluster, will facilitate the rehabilitation and conversions to cooperative ownerships of seven partially occupied city-owned buildings in Central Harlem. The properties are located in Councilmember Perkins District in Manhattan. LUS 400, 401, and 402 are applications to facilitate rehabilitation and preservation of four mixed-use residential buildings in Manhattan in the districts of Councilmember Rodriguez, Perkins, and Levin. We will also vote to approve LUs 416 and 417 to HPD applications related to Manhattanville Walkway at 437 West 126th Street in Councilmember Levin's district in Manhattan. LUs 416, an application for the acquisition of property located at 437 West 126th Street. LUs 417 is an application pursuant to Article 16 of the General Municipal Law for the designation of such properties as an urban development action area and approval of an urban development action area project and the disposition of such properties to a developer to be selected by the HPD. The proposed action will facilitate the construction of a landscape walkway that will serve as a public open space and potentially be used as an outdoor seating area for local res restaurants or for food stalls or other community services. We will vote to approve LUs 418, the Brownsville North Ocean Hill Neighborhood Construction Program Project in Councilmember Ampre Samuels District in Brooklyn. Designation of properly located at 37... 379-384 Howard Avenue and 1297 East New York Avenue as an urban development action area due to that project approval along with dispositions of the properties will facilitate the construction of two buildings containing a total of approximately 32 units of, of affordable housing. We will vote to approve LUs 415, the JFK North Site, an application for city map amendment and the authority for related acquisition or disposition for siting Council Member Rich's district in Queens. The elimination of a map portion of Nossa Expressa will create two new tax lots, which will be disposed by the Economic Development Corporation to facilitate the development of a distribution and vehicle repair facility for Bartlett Dairy and family-owned businesses. Finally, we will, also, we will also vote to approve the modifications LU-410, the Haven Green Senior Housing Application for Property in Councilmember Chin's District, Manhattan. Pursuant to Sections 576-A-2 of the Private Housing Finance Law and Section 197-C of the City Charter, HPD requests approval for the disposition of city-owned property located at 199-207 Elizabeth Street to the project sponsor. This will facilitate the development of a new seven-story building with 123 LGBTQ-friendly affordable units for seniors with on-site supportive services, nonprofit space, a community room, and storefront commercial space. This was a much debated application, but the dialogue led to a balanced project and a better outcome overall. We have strengthened the integrity of this project by modifying it to ensure that the open space will be preserved in perpetuity and open to the public for approximately 12 hours per day, depending on the season. Are there any questions or remarks from members of the committee? All right. Seeing none. See none, I will now call on a vote in accordance with the recommendations of the local members and of the subcommittees to approve 2018531 SCK, 2018533 SCX, 2019577 SCX, and 2019564 SCX, LUs 398, 399, 400, 401, 402, 415, 416, 417, and 418, and to approve the modifications. I have described preconsiders LUs 410, preconsiders LUs 420 through 423, LUs 424 through 427, and preconsiders LUs 436 and 437. Will the clerk please call the roll? Lee Martin, committee clerk, roll call vote committee on land use. All items are a couple. Chair Salamanca. Aye or no? Gibson. Permission to explain? Council Member Gibson to explain. Thank you so much, Chair Salamanca, and good morning, colleagues. I am extremely excited that today the Land Use Committee will vote on a brand new 458-seat school in my district, in School District 9 in the Borough of the Bronx, and it is a long time coming in recognizing that our population continues to grow in the Bronx. After the Jerome Avenue rezoning that was passed by this council last year, it is more than 
than fitting that we continue to invest in our neighborhoods and recognize that this is not just about building more affordable housing, but looking at all of the amenities that we are afforded in our districts, including new school seats. Um, this land use application has been a long journey, and I certainly want to recognize the land use staff, particularly want to thank Raju, Amy, and especially uh, Jeff, who has been with me during this process, and my school district, my CEC District 9, and really everyone in Bronx Community Board 4 in my district. I am so proud we are getting a brand new school that is long awaited, pre-K through fifth grade, with all of the amenities that our children should be afforded. Um, this is my first school project in my tenure here in the council, um, but prior to that serving in the assembly, I had the honor of opening new schools in District 9. So this is a long journey, and I'm so proud. I'm excited, and I ask all of you to please vote for this along with all the other items, but this is a great day for the West Bronx, and we're going to see this new school open in a few years, and I could not be more proud of the work of this council and certainly on behalf of my district. So with that, I vote aye on all, and thank you so much to the Land Use Division. Deutsch. Aye. Kuh. Aye. Lanceman. <coughs> Miller. Aye. Reynoso. I just want to, uh, permission to explain my vote? The council member Reynoso to explain his vote. Uh, I will be voting aye on all. I just want to acknowledge the fact that we will be getting 100, uh, over 120 senior um, housing units um, in council member Rivera's district. And when we talk, oh. Uh, Chen's district. Oh, I'm sorry. Look at that. <laughs> it's all that he asked to me. Um, no, but I just want to, uh, I'm grateful for the fact that um, we're being thoughtful about building um, uh, in areas that don't look like what the city of New York has traditionally been building around um, and that we're, we're taking bold steps um, to build, uh, again, in areas that I think are considered like high opportunity is what I want to use. It was HPD's new term, but I really want to thank you for that. Um, and I'm excited to see that senior housing go up. So I want to vote aye on all with uh, uh, congratulations to Councilmember Chin. Richards. Permission to explain my vote. Councilmember Richards. Thank please. you, Chair Salamanca. It's an honor to be here today to usher in nearly 200 jobs back into Southeast Queens with the passage of this proposal that welcomes Bartlett Dairy back to its homeland. Hundreds of Queens residents can now work back in the community that they call home with additional opportunities for more jobs and apprenticeships for high school students looking for, toward their first career or homeless families looking for the right job to find that path to stability. Bartlett Dairy has committed to working with local partners such as Spring Jam and Spring Garden Civics, Saratoga Family and Shelter, Community Boards 12 and 13, and Springfield High School. And my colleagues, of course, I want to thank Danique Miller and Adrian Adams, who've been uh, good, great partners on this as well. Bartlett has also committed to a 50% local hiring goal with 25% goal of MWBEs for construction design and service costs of the project. Bartlett will be working with the Gateway JFK, JFK IBID and will provide annual hiring updates for the first five years of the project. They will also be installing 35 trees on site to help with stormwater management with an outdoor picnic area for employees at lunch. The D Department of Transportation will also resurface Rockaway Boulevard between Farmers and Brookville Boulevard in fiscal year 2020, and the strip between South Conduit and Farmers will be resurfaced following the completion of a sewer project currently in the design phase. Construction begins in 2021 and, we, and will be completed in 2024. DOT has also filled all potholes and will continue to monitor and maintain a roadway. We've also received a commitment from the Parks Department meant to expedite construction on the replacement track and field turf and adult fitness equipment at Baisley Pond Park with my colleague Adrian Adams and much more, which will help improve public green space in the area. I'd like to thank Bartlett Dairy for their commitment to delivering jobs back to Queens, EDC for their diligence in securing economic development opportunities for the residents of Southeast Queens and the surrounding JFK area, the de Blasio administration, including DOT and Parks, for helping to bring this project across the finish line, and of course, our land use staff, Raju Mann, John Douglas, and everyone who's worked uh, to get us to the finish line on this. Uh, it's a great day for Queens, a great day to bring jo jobs back, and let me be quiet before this uh, Novocaine wears off. Um, <laughs> but with that being said, I vote aye on all. <laughs> Traeger. 
I vote aye. Gordon Chick. Aye. Adams. With uh, congratulations to my colleagues, Council Members Gibson, Council Member Chin, Council Member Rose, and special mention uh, to Southeast Queens and our Bartlett uh, Dairy Project. Just to echo a little bit of Council Member Richard's sentiment, we are very excited about uh, the Bartlett Project coming near and dear to our uh, JFK project as well. So I enthusiastically vote aye on all. Diaz. Yes or no? Rivera. Aye. Barron. I vote aye on all. I vote a 14 in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and no abstentions. All items have been adopted by the committee. Thank you all. We will keep the roll open. Now we will hear intro 1058 by Councilmember Espinal by request of Brooklyn Borough President, a local law in relations to developing a comprehensive urban agricultural plan. The bill will provide that the Department of City Planning prepare comprehensive urban agricultural plan in cooperation with relevant agencies and stakeholders. The bill would require that such plan address, among other things, cataloging existing and potential urban agricultural spaces. All right, so let me start this again. So the bill will provide that the Department of City Planning prepare a comprehensive agricultural plan in cooperation with relevant agencies and stakeholders. The bill would require that such plan address, among other things, cataloging existing and potential urban agricultural space, the integration of urban agricultural into the city's conservation and resiliency plan, expanding the availability of healthy foods in low-income neighborhoods, direct and indirect job creation that may result from urban agriculture and portions of the zoning resolution, building code, and fire code that permit amendment in order to promote urban agriculture. I now recognize Councilmember Spinal to offer for a statement in, su in support of the legislation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good morning, my name is Rafael Espinal, and I'm the prime sponsor of Intro 1058, which aims to create an urban ag plan for the city of New York. I would like to thank the Chair, Councilmember Salamanca, and the 46 colleagues who are signed on to this important bill. For too long, urban farmers have had their growth stymied by unclear regulations and zoning. This legislation asks the Department of City Planning to create a comprehensive urban ag plan in order to better serve existing farms and promote this vital industry. When we support urban farms and community gardens, we are creating more equitable access to affordable and healthy food, and we're creating a new green jobs in local communities. We have to strive past making sure no New Yorker is going hungry and go a step further to ensure that no New Yorker is starved of fresh food. In low-income neighborhoods like the ones I represent, our community gardens that grow food are an essential tool in closing the freshness gap. Gardeners have worked hard to transform vacant and neglected lots into environmental havens that provide their neighborhoods with communal green space filled with native plants and fresh food. The majority of local produce harvested in New York City is grown in the soil of a community garden. 
Studies have shown that urban ag is estimated to be a $9 billion industry in the U.S. and has the potential to feed 20 million people in New York City. Technology surrounding urban ag is increasing the capacity of these farms to produce more food and finding unique spaces to grow fresh produce. The industry and its revenue can go directly into our communities, into training and employing people with sustainable jobs and reducing the carbon footprint of our city. Not to mention uh, the vital role that community gardens also play in fighting climate change and also building uh, communities. I'm proud that the city has able to set up, I'm proud that the city was able to set up an urban ag website which was a significant step forward that wouldn't have been possible without the voices of many of those who are in the room with us today. However, the site is a means to achieve our urban ag vision, and today we are asking the city to take the next step in making that vision a reality. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Council Member. Now I, uh, I call on the first panel. Um, we have Mr. Alex Sommer from City Planning. Did I get that right? Yes. I'm sorry. You're all right. And Allison McCabe. I get that right? All right. Uh, the, uh, the council will swear you in. Please raise your right hands and say your name. Alex Summer. Alex Summer. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but your truth in your testimony before this committee and in response to all council member questions? I do. Thank you. You may begin your presentation. Good afternoon, Chair Salamenka and Council Member Espinal uh, and distinguished members of the Land Use Committee. My name is Alex Summer, and I'm the Deputy Director of the Brooklyn Borough Office of the New York City Department of City Planning. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today to discuss intro 1058 regarding urban agriculture in our city. I'm joined here by my colleague, Allison McCabe. She's the deputy counsel at city planning to testify and answer questions on this proposal. I'd like to also note my personal interest in urban agriculture. I participated in a chicken apprenticeship program and egg cooperative in a community garden in Crown Heights. Uh, and that gave me the confidence to raise three chickens with my roommates and share free fresh eggs with my neighbors. So my heart's in this. Uh, intro 1058 proposes a local law in relation to developing an urban agricultural plan in New York City. You may recall that former DCP General Counsel Anita Lermont testified on this topic in 2017, and we'd like to reiterate that DCP and the administration support urban agriculture and recognize the many benefits that agriculture provides to New Yorkers, offering educational opportunities, strengthening community networks, and helping to improve environmental conditions in our neighborhoods. We continue to be very supportive of urban agriculture and eager to work with the City Council to advance uh, urban agriculture in, in, New, in New York City. As New Yorkers, we are all probably familiar with community-run gardens, which provide opportunities for residents to connect with nature, improve the environment, beautify public open space, learn about growing and preparing nutritious foods, and form social bonds with communities. Um, but schools and housing developments throughout the city are also building and maintaining their own on-site farms, and larger for-profit businesses are now starting to partake in indoor farming, hydroponics, and aquaponics, and developing new technologies to grow high-quality food in dense urban environments. Because of the long history of urban agriculture in New York City, and the significant value that it brings to our communities, the city has many initiatives and resources for community gardeners and urban farmers. Green Thumb, the New York City Parks Department Community Gardening Program, provides technical assistance workshops, programming, and material support to over 550 community gardens and 20,000 volunteer gardeners. The Grow to Learn NYC initiative, which, which is part of Grow NYC, supports more than 780 school gardens and over half of the city's schools. Children are connected to the science of growing food and essential nutritional uh, education. Many of our city's community programs, such as the Department of Youth and Community Development funded after school sites or Department for the Aging funded senior centers have gardens and offer educational programs about farming, the environment, and healthy foods. The Farms at NYCHA initiative maintains six food producing farms at NYCHA developments, which are constructed and operated by 18 to 24 year old NYCHA residents and expand healthy food access to their communities. And the small but growing number of commercial for-profit farms in New York City help increase the supply of locally sourced food and offer a unique op uh, economic development opportunity for residents and businesses. Regarding DCP's role in these efforts, we are uh, extremely proud to note that our city's zoning is flexible for urban agriculture. It's allowed in every residential, commercial, and manufacturing zoning district in New York City, with a minor exception for areas zoned for amusement parks. The definition of agricultural uses within the zoning resolution includes farming, hydroponics, and aquaponics, and can be conducted outside or in unenclosed spaces, in yards, inside of buildings, or on rooftops of buildings. And the definition is broad enough to also allow for the sale of products that are grown on site. 
This includes the sale of produce from commercial agricultural operations, either on site or distributed for sale in another location. As noted earlier, this can occur in all zoning districts um, across the city, including in our residential districts. In addition, as part of the Zone Green Initiative approved in 2012, a new City Planning Commission certification was created to allow rooftop greenhouses as a permitted obstruction. Uh, which should note, greenhouses are also still allowed as of right. This provision creates additional flexibility in allowing greenhouses to be exempt from floor area and offering relief from the maximum building height limits set by zoning. DCP meets regularly with residents and businesses across the five boroughs and fields zoning questions and comments at our zoning help desk. We have not been made aware of any barrier in the zoning resolution to any urban agricultural project or of any land use regulation that would otherwise hamper a proposed agricultural project, farm, business, or development from moving forward. Of course, if there is a concern that the zoning resolution is creating specific barriers, we encourage operators and elected officials to discuss uh, zoning challenges with us. In response to Local Law 46 of 2018, uh, which resulted from the bill uh, mentioned earlier, DCP worked with New York City Parks Department, the Department of Small Business Services, and Do It to create a one-stop shop with resources, programs, and regulations related to agriculture in New York City. The New York City Urban Agricultural website was released in June 2018 and can be found at nyc.gov agriculture. The website includes a resources page that links to a range of agricultural-related city programs and an extensive FAQ section that describes the process for starting and operating <laughs> community gardens and commercial agricultural businesses. The website includes descriptions of relevant zone ex uh, sections of the zoning resolution and several diagrams to illustrate how um, uh, locally produced food uh, can be distributed, sold, or donated uh, in the city. The website has been positively received by many organizations uh, involved in urban agriculture in New York City and has been viewed more than 7,000 times since its release less than a year ago. Local Law 46 also required the city to document city-owned spaces that are available and potentially suitable for community urban agricultural uses, and this data set was created by the Department of Parks and Recreation and is now available on NYC Open Data. During 2018, the Department of Small Business Services also created an urban agricultural quick, quick guide that describes the typical permitting requirements, licenses, and regulations that may apply to commercial agricultural businesses in New York City. DCP is also committed to expanding the availability of, fre of fresh, healthy food in low-income neighborhoods, one of the elements of the uh, listed in the proposed bill. The FRESH program, adopted in 2009 by the City Council, facilitates the development of grocery stores selling a full range of food products in underserved neighborhoods with an emphasis on fresh fruits and vegetables, meats, and other perishable goods. The department is actively working with the City Council's Land Use Division and individual council members to develop a proposal to update and expand the applicability of the FRESH program in appropriate areas identified by the Supermarket Needs Index. We welcome uh, the conversations with council members who may be interested in expanding the program within their district. Um, in conclusion, DCP and the administration are encouraged by the work that is already underway across many agencies, nonprofits, community groups, and uh, businesses as a whole to support and expand urban agriculture in New York City. We are certainly open to ideas about programmatic improvements or regulatory changes to further facilitate agriculture in New York City. However, before embarking on any comprehensive planning effort, we would first hope to learn about the issues facing urban agricultural community in the city and afford the new website and resources offered by agencies time to do their intended job so that we can expend city resources efficiently and effectively, focusing on any identified barriers or needs that warrant further study. We very much appreciate the opportunity to testify and welcome further discussions with you on this matter. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I'm going to hand it off to Council Member Spina. Thank you. Uh, so sorry, can, can you repeat, does the administration support the bill? We support the growth of urban agriculture broadly, and uh, we want to work with you on identifying specific issues. But in terms of the comprehensive plan, we want to make sure that we're identifying specific issues first before moving ahead with that. OK, so I, I would encourage uh, the administration to stay here and listen to testimony from everyone who's going to speak up today. They're the, they're the real experts here. Um, I'm just a messenger trying to get this done, only because I also acknowledge that there, there are issues, you know, across the board, whether you're a community gardener or you're a part of the industry, uh, they still feel that there, there are barriers, they're under threats uh, every single day. Uh, for example, uh, just a few minutes ago, there was a vote to uh, build on uh, Elizabeth Street Garden. Um, and I, I believe that if the city was to take a real comprehensive approach, that they 
would have realized the important role that gardens like Elizabeth would, would play in the overall ecosystem of these communities. For example, a few months ago, Mandela Garden being bulldozed by HPD to prioritize building affordable housing, which we all acknowledge is very important. But um, you know, advocates have identified other plots of land that were not being used as gardens that could have been built on. So I, I think that there is a serious uh, you know, gap or a blind spot uh, from, from City Hall. Uh, and we need to pay uh, more attention to what's actually happening on the ground in order to uh, really play a leading role in this conversation. As of now, we have cities across the country uh, uh, that have created a plan, uh, that have created a roadmap, that have um, created some sort of codified document in that they're protecting their, their green spaces and, and the, uh, creating the opportunity for industries to grow as well. So. I think more has to be done. Uh, this bill, I do believe, will get us there. Uh, I don't see this as being something difficult to pass uh, or get done. You know, it just simply ask this administration to create a plan, working with advocates, working with a task force uh, to get it done. I think it'll be a great addition uh, to the overall plan of how we move our city uh, forward. Um, so I, I guess my, my question is, that do you, um, I guess, is there any, any uh, insight that, that the that DCP can give as to why community gardens um, are not being prioritized when we talk about overall development in our city? Um, so we, we recognize that there's uh, a whole host of different priorities across the city. Open space, affordable housing uh, among some of the top priorities. Um, we rely on the ongoing uh, public review process to help weigh those priorities uh, as projects move forward. Um, and, and that's why we always want to work with uh, the city council and the public at large so that, that those discussions can be had. We know it's very difficult, um, and there's a lot of things that we have to, we have to pick between, and, and that's why we think the public review process is the ideal uh, discussion uh, forum for that. And, and, and now that we're on the topic of, of urban um, uh, gardens and community gardens, I was made aware recently of uh, licenses renewals that would hand it out to, to gardens across the city. And some of the stipulations uh, that, that gardeners have to follow, or community gardeners have to follow, actually puts them at risk of having their garden taken away from them. For example, uh, I think that one of the stipulations asks that, that the garden has to remain open seven days a week. Uh, we do know that these gardens are volunteer-based led. Uh, they're not getting paid to run these gardens. Uh, and there's fear amongst the community that if, for example, they're not able to keep the garden open seven days a week because of other priorities uh, in their personal lives, that that would be an excuse for the city to come in and be able to um, take over the garden and use it for, for example, housing. Um, and again, I, I urge you, the city, to stay here and just listen to everyone's testimony. I think we'll have better insight hearing from them. But I'm very committed to passing this bill uh, this time around, and, and hopefully uh, the city could be a partner in making, in making that happen. I just wanted to add to that that there are on ongoing discussions that the, the administration is having with gardeners on that issue. There, the administration is having ongoing discussions with gardeners on that issue. Okay, great. I'm glad to hear. Uh, and then when it, when it comes to the industry, their concerns is more around um, uh, the city not really, not really codifying or creating regulations around what is allowed permissible by them, which makes it difficult for them. Uh, to be able to uh, get seed funding to, to grow their businesses within our city as well. And I think that's something the city has to continue thinking about. Uh, and again, I hope to hear from the testimony later. Thank you. Do you uh, currently have a list of all, all community gardens in the city of New York and under whose jurisdiction they fall under? Sure, so that, that list exists and a map exists with the Department of Parks and Recreation um, and uh, I don't know if we can access it online here. Let me see if there's a, an image of it. But uh, it's about 550 community gardens, yeah. uh, 100 acres or so, and we, we do have a map of that. And there's a link on, on this website as well. I have quite a few of them in my council district. They're very popular. Um, with the budget season, I ensure that I, I allocate funding to keep these gardens moving. Um, but there has been concerns. Now, these gardens are under the jurisdiction of Parks Department, not HPD. Um, in most cases, there are some exceptions where uh, there's other city agencies that control the site or a nonprofit entity that controls the site. And what are the terms of agreements? Should there be a garden there for about 10 years, the site belongs to another city agency, and the city agency decides that they want to take over that 
that location? Uh, it really depends on the ownership of the site, um, on what the pro on what the zoning is, what the process is for going through a public review process for that. Um, and so each case is pretty unique um, in how and how that would happen. Has there ever been a conversation about um, changing the zoning of these gardens to just that use, which is a garden use? Um, there are communities where there's a block, there's a garden, but it's zoned as, as an R7. You know, uh, is there is there uh, has there ever been any conversations from your agency to to change the zoning on all 500 gardens in the city of New York? Um, there have been instances where uh, the zoning has been changed to uh, be actually mapped as parkland. Um, and, and that means DPR controls it, and that actually means that there is no zoning there. Um, but uh, there hasn't been a citywide approach to doing that because, again, um, each case is really unique about who owns the site, how it's operated, and whether it's city or nonprofit or private entity. But these city, these, these community gardens that are listed in, in, in your website, they, they are city-owned lands, right? They're not, non, they're not they're, it's not non-for-profit. Uh, land or privately owned land? I'll, I'll have to get back to you. I'm actually not sure if all 550 are city owned or if some of them actually include private uh, or nonprofit entities. I'll have to get back to you on that. All right, thank you. You have any further questions, Council Member? So, so you mentioned there are about 500 gardens on, on the website. I've heard numbers of there being over 1,000 gardens that exist citywide, and those are, those are gardens that are in HPD sites that are actually being run by, by community groups and nonprofits, is that correct? Uh, we, there's 550 on the website itself, um, and I, like I said, I'll have to get back to you guys on, on whether they're all city owned or under DPR ownership or nonprofit. Okay, yeah, so just, just for clarification, I think part of the bill uh, do, does call for, for there being a, a, catalog, a catalog of existing and potential urban act spaces as well, which is why I think it's also an important bill to pass and get done. And, and just to add on that, um, the Department of Parks and Rec Recreation has another um, map layer that is on NYC open data, which includes not only the existing, but other potential uh, sites for community gardens. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your, your presentation. All right, so up next, we're going to bring up, uh, we have a representative from um, the Brooklyn Borough President, Eric Adams' office. If I mispronounce your name, my apologies. Um, Assis Dekan, Ricky Steffens, and uh, Samira Berus. Did I, did I get that? My apologies. Um, and then I just want to remind um, everyone that's here to, that's going to testify that we have a hard stop here today at 1 p.m. So we're going to. We're going to set the clock. Every, uh, everyone's going to, all the public speakers are going to get two minutes. Uh, but if you want to give up some of your time and you have testimony that you want to submit, we'll, we'll also be taking that as well. But before we move forward, we have to, uh, I want to recognize uh, Chair Moya and uh, the will Wait, you roll call, Committee on Land Use, Council Member Moya. I know. Final vote on all items on today's land use agenda are adopted by a vote of 15 in the affir affirmative, zero, the negative, and no abstentions. So I want to thank all my colleagues and council staff for uh, today's um, votes. And um, for the record, uh, the, the roll is, is closed. All right, so we'll start with, uh, I guess we'll, we'll start with you. Um, and, and I'm going to ask the Sergeant of Arms if they can set the clock at two minutes for each speaker. Just please introduce yourself before you begin. Uh, my name is Aziz Dekan. I'm the Executive Director of the New York City Community Garden Coalition. Uh, Councilman, you did a really good name on my job, on my name, uh, a job on my name. I can't even speak. Um, I want to thank Councilman Espinal. Uh, Borough President Adams and the 40 uh, uh, council members who are signed on to this bill. I think it's a good start, but there's a lot of work to be done. Um, couple, a few, within the last few years, the words community gardens have finally entered the lexicon of New York City, and we're, we're encouraged by that, but we still have a long way to go. As you heard from 
um, the, the city planners. We still need a lot of protection. We need permanence of community gardens. We need more community gardens. We can't let the wedge of affordable housing and community gardens continue in this city. Um, they are compatible, and um, if you really wanted to, if the city really wanted to do something about affordable housing, they would have made Hudson Yards affordable housing. So, you know, that's a false argument that uh, dates back to Rudy Giuliani, and we need to change that language. But back to community gardens, I think the, the key that we want to talk about is making these gardens permanent. Um, give them protection. Uh, uh, Councilman Espinal talked about the license issues. Um, there are a number of issues that, that stop community gardens from doing certain things. Um, growing food is, is a really important piece of being able to give communities fresh produce that they do not have in their neighborhoods. Um, we talk about ways to protect gardens, uh, community gardens in the city. We can do that through community land trusts. We can do that through uh, garden districts. There's multiple ways to make community gardens permanent and to keep them safe and to make sure, not just to protect them, but to find other places to make gardens permanent and to create gardens. I think one of the problems that I have with city planning is that all too many uh, gardens are listed as vacant land. And it's not vacant land, folks. It's real land. It's worked by the neighbors. And we have to change that language, too. Language has meaning. And I know my time is up. Give me 10 more seconds. Language has meaning. And if you really want this task force to move forward, we need to make sure that the language in that task force and that task force has people who understand what these issues are all about. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you for the opportunity to speak about the uh, comprehensive urban agriculture plan. My name is Samira Behruz. I'm program manager at the Design Trust for Public Space, a nonprofit uh, dedicated to the future of public space in New York City. Our projects bring together city agencies and community groups to make a lasting impact through design on how New Yorkers live, work, and play. Design Trust five bar farm project in partnership with added value New York City parks and farm and concrete offered a roadmap to understand the cross sector benefits of urban agriculture to our health, social capital, environment and economy and to provide resources to grow urban farming and gardening throughout New York City. The five bar farm policy recommendations included the creation of an urban agriculture plan that established goals objectives and a citywide land use scheme for garden and farm development. Integrates urban agriculture into existing city plans, programs and policy making processes and addresses disparities in access for gardeners and farmers to funding, information and other resources by creating more transparent and participatory processes. The proposed legislation aligns with these recommendations. However, systems of accountability are essential the plan must apply to all forms of urban agriculture, not just commercial ventures, including community gardens, school gardens, permaculture gardens, and vertical farms. We urge the city council to incorporate these following three ways to ensure accountability in creating and executing the plan, and to engage an expert in food systems to lead an open and transparent planning process. One, a citywide task force similar to the roundtable convened by Brooklyn Bar President Adams in 2016 with city agencies, support organizations, and gardeners and farmers. Two, open forums. At many points in the plan's development process, including spring gardening and farming events such as Grow Together and Making Brooklyn Bloom. Three, communication within the city and gardening and farming support organization and advocacy networks including Green Thumb, NYCHA's Garden and Greening uh, Program and New York City Community Garden Coalition. We've waited a long time for a plan. Let's ensure all New Yorkers can benefit. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, before move, move, we move on, I have to go downstairs to the budget negotiating team um, meeting, so I'm gonna hand over the committee to you, Council Member Spinato, all right? Thank you all. all right. Thanks everyone for allowing me to be here. Thank you especially to Council Member Espinal for your leadership on this matter. My name is Ricky Stevens. I'm a co-founder of AgTechX and recently now director of digital strategy at Agritecture Consulting. <clears throat> For the sake of time and given my area of focus, I'm going to speak purely from the commercial urban agriculture standpoint. However, I would like to highlight my support for all forms of urban farming, and my hope is that a comprehensive plan 
addresses the needs of the many stakeholders who benefit from the range of positive environmental and socioeconomic services that Urban Ag provides. So I recognize my colleagues here, folks like Aziz and many others who hopefully will speak after me for the work that they've done on that front. <clears throat> in two years of running, the city's only shared workspace focused exclusively on urban agriculture and local food system innovation. AgTechX was uniquely situated to observe and analyze the explosive popularity for these topics. We hosted 35 co-working members, put on over 100 events, including a major conference that attracted more than 650 registrants to New York City, and have had more than 2,500 total guests visit our small office in Brooklyn. Using our space as a hub to gain knowledge and connections in this industry, our visitors have primarily been New York City residents, but others have hailed from places like Brazil, France, Tanzania, Japan, Australia, to name a few. Overwhelmingly, these visitors are well-educated young professionals who are seeking jobs in a more impact-driven field, looking to create jobs here through entrepreneurship, or are looking to size up the opportunity for bringing their existing businesses to New York City. All of these visitors consider New York to be at the forefront of innovation when it comes to food, technology, urban design, and cultural diversity, foundations to encourage positive business growth in the urban agriculture field. However, my worry is that at, as these innovators uncover the more hidden barriers to entry and their associated risks and costs, they will flee for greener pastures. Some of those greener pastures include Chicago, Boston, and Los Angeles. Are there just a few places of the, the many other US cities that have already adopted comprehensive urban agriculture plans or made supportive amendments to zoning policies to spur the growth of this industry? New York City has been behind the curve. Let's use this bill to change this, please. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you. Kathleen Daniel reading the testimony of the Brooklyn Borough President, Eric L. Adams. I want to thank Chair Rafael Salamanca, Jr. and the Committee on Land Use for giving me the opportunity to provide comments at this public hearing. Additionally, I would like to thank Council Member Espinal for introducing this legislation on my behalf, as well as his council colleagues for co-sponsoring this important legislation. The impetus of this legislation stems not only from the historic challenges of unsecured land tenure for community gardens throughout neighborhoods across New York City, but also from meeting time and again with urban agriculture companies during my visits to neighborhoods throughout Brooklyn. I was and continue to be inspired by the entrepreneurial spirit that produces fruits and vegetables in Brooklyn using new forms of tech-focused agriculture such as aeroponics and closed-loop aquaponics. Unfortunately, I hear over and over again about the difficulty of receiving city agencies approval for these companies, which were often being set upon up on rooftops and in warehouses. This frustration prompted the most logical next step, which was to bring city agencies to the table to speak with advocates and industry leaders on the issue of permits and regulations. Two years ago, I hosted a roundtable in partnership with Councilmember Espinal at Brooklyn Borough Hall with 10 city agencies and more than 20 urban agricultural companies and nonprofit organizations. The takeaway was clear. Agriculture is only mentioned in a handful of items in the zoning resolution, and city agencies were placing responsibility on one another to regulate this emerging industry. But no one was taking any clear regulatory responsibility. This resulted in more questions and answers for urban agriculture companies and no clear path for fresh food and job creation. While we've seen successful companies like Brooklyn Grange and Gotham Greens take root, many more companies have labored trying to get their businesses off the ground. Meanwhile, cities such as Atlanta, Boston, Chicago, and Newark are plowing forward with an urban agriculture revolution. Intro 1058 asked the New York City Department of City Planning to take the first step in playing catch up with so many other cities by developing a comprehensive urban agriculture plan that addresses land use and other regulatory issues. The website created in response to our last attempt at getting a comprehensive plan passed is a nice resource, but it does not fully address the challenges facing this growing industry. We need a real plan, and I support the creation of a task force to create and implement this plan. Since being on my own journey with type 2 diabetes, I've noticed how deadly our food system has become. Fast, processed foods dominate our lives. From our school lunches to our grocery stores to restaurants throughout the borough, we're killing ourselves with the food we eat. The data amplifies a problem. According to a 2007 to 2010 Center for Disease Control and Prevention survey, 87% of adults failed to meet their daily recommended vegetable intake. 
That's no surprise to me, considering bodegas represent 80% of the food source in neighborhoods in central and northern Brooklyn, according to the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene's analysis of their Healthy Bodegas Initiative from 2008. On average, only 10% of bodegas carry leafy green vegetables, according to a 2006 DOHMH study. These are food deserts filled with processed foods, plain and simple. We must have equity of access for fresh, healthy food and stop flooding our neighborhoods that have the greatest need with the least healthy alternatives. As Brooklyn's borough, pre Brooklyn borough president, it is my job to advocate for the health and well-being of my constituents. That is why I'm calling for the passage of this legislation. We can clear the way for urban and vertical agriculture. Then we can begin to sow the seeds for a food revolution that produces healthy food and access to communities from Bensonhurst to Brownsville. <coughs> Through the support and expansion of community gardens and urban farming, we can reduce transportation costs, negative environmental effects, and other externalities associated with shipping logistics while opening up job opportunities to the next generation of entrepreneurs. That's why I contributed $1 million in capital funding to the Brooklyn Navy Yard, Navy Yard for the establishment of an urban agriculture tech incubator so we can foster startups to crack the high energy cost in real estate code. Looking to the future, I initiated Growing Brooklyn's Future, committing more than $7 million in capital funding for projects across Brooklyn. These include hydroponic classrooms, in schools across the borough in partnership with New York Sunworks, a greenhouse at the Urban Assembly Unison School in partnership with Councilmember Lori Combo, and Teens for Food Justice, as well as green roofs and rooftop gardens at other schools. This investment recognizes the need to prepare for the workforce of the future that is coming, an urban fresh food revolution. As our young people are preparing for this future, the question remains, Will the city be prepared for them? This legislation and the capital contribution are a win-win for Brooklyn and the city of New York. I hope this committee and the city council pass the legislation and send it to the mayor for his signature so we can begin the fresh and healthy food revolution. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, before I go to the next panel, just one quick question. Can, can uh, um, Aziz and Ricky identify and public space, one issue you think that the that the city can can tackle with a comprehensive plan? Yeah, sure. I can maybe <clears throat> two examples. One is if you look at Boston's plan passed in 2013, Article 89. Um, part of what they did was expediting um, land use changes to quicken the launch time for new urban farms. And then another thing that I think we need to look at here with DCP is there's a lot of talk about the review process. My understanding is that the review process does not have any sort of assessment for fresh food access. Why not? Um, and that should include not just uh, grocery stores, but also gardens, urban farms, et cetera. All right, thank you. I think earlier I said uh, permanence it is really important, and mapping is also really important. I don't think we know enough about how many vacant lots are out there, how many vacant lots the city would, would intend to turn into community gardens. Um, it, it's a little on the other side of this is, how many, how many uh, parcels does HPD actually have when they claim that they don't have a lot of land to, and they want to take community gardens away and open space away? I think those are some of the takeaways. Plus, as we talked about before in, in one of our meetings, uh, Councilman, I think it's important to, to recognize how to save them through community land trusts as one and districts as another. Um, we do it all the time with, in the theater district. We did it with the High Line. I think we can do it with community gardens. But we have to find a way to make them permanent and find another way to make to turn you know, real vacant lots, mm -hmm. <laughs> not vacant lots that are actually community gardens, but real vacant lots, turn them, in, them into community gardens. Got it. And give money to, to, to Green Thumb to be able to let them support that also. I mean, we need resources, and the resources come from the city. Thank you. OK, great. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Up next, we have Kiana Mickey, Keith Carr, Alessandro Ciari, Hema Garcia, and Onika Abraham Lee.
You may begin. Oh. Hi, um, my name is, um, well, thank you for having me. My name is Kiana Miki. I am the executive director of Just Food. Just Food is a grassroots nonprofit based in New York City with the aim to shift the power, health, and wealth of historically and economically marginalized communities, in particular, black and Latinx um, communities of color, um, other communities of color, LGBTQ, mixed income, and small scale farmers and producers. We connect New York City institutions, businesses, and individuals um, with sustainable, small and mid-scale regional growers and train community leaders as they work collectively towards a more economically viable democratic food system grounded in the principles of cooperation, solidarity, and equity. Um, thanks again for having me um, here to submit testimony. I submitted testimony um, in 2017 at the last hearing on Initiative 1661 that, um, where I expressed concerns in consideration of a comprehensive urban ag plan. Um, with um, Initiative 1015, 1058 being identical in all respects with the exception of the urban agriculture plan being posted on the DCP website by July 20, 2019. I'm in support of comprehensive urban ag policy, but I must lift up remaining concerns that this initiative, um, as it stands now, because it misses critical key findings and evidence that grassroots groups like Just Food, as well as city agencies such as DCP, explored and lifted up within the past two years between these two resolutions. Um, I think these are critical elements that should not go unanswered, and the introduction of a new bill should reflect the lessons learned to support the breadth of New York City urban ag, in particular in communities that have been the most impacted. To ensure a comprehensive urban ag plan for New York City, there must be a tenant of racial, economic, and environmental equity within legislation. Um, as I mentioned in 2017, it must include and benefit those who have worked in the soil, grown food, developed community at great expense and livelihood. In my testimony today, and you have the, the details, I want to lift up areas around zoning, land, and enterprise that can increase equity within New York Urban Ag and recommendations. Um, in this um, initiative, or the last initiative, three city agencies were um, ordered to develop an urban ag website. Um, that, that happened. Um, DCP and Just Food last fall, along with Yemi Aku um, of Oku Farms, um, an aquaponics farmer in Brooklyn, collaborated together and shared information around innovations around urban ag that currently are supported within our current zoning ordinances. So we feel that the website is there, the information is there, the current zoning is already there that supports the breadth of urban ag, and we feel that it still affirms the analysis that was done by DCP in order to support any urban agriculture that is here. Um, I do believe that this initiative right now holds older language that was left from 1661, and that should be taken out. Um, and after much research and shared learning with DCP, it, it would be harmful to continue to venture into considering changing zonings, because that's how neighborhoods flip and make it vulnerable to de development, gentrification, and community displacement. Um, Thank I it started. We, we have your testimony. Okay. So yeah, we're, we're, we're gonna hold it. Uh, the attorneys will look at it, and we're gonna take everything into Thank account. You. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Keith Carr. I'm the program manager for food access at City Harvest. Um, everyone knows what City Harvest is, so I don't have to go into that. But this year, um, we plan to collect about 64 million pounds of excess produce to feed 1.3 million New Yorkers, um, and we really can't do it without you. Um, uh, but for City Harvest to be successful, it takes that partnership between both public and private partners. Um, the same way we partner with upstate and local agriculture to provide food for hungry New Yorkers, a significant collaboration with urban agriculture um, would do the same thing on a hyper-local area, on hyper-local um, hyper um, farming, and urban farming will provide even more support to the emergency feeding programs. Um, that we serve. Um, just to give some scale, New York City has 15,000 acres of unused um, rooftops and just the neighborhood of East New York alone has more than 45,000 square feet of publicly owned unused land. Um, so an organized and determined approach to um, a comprehensive land, um, comprehensive and exclusive plan to urban agriculture could greatly increase the amount of healthy foods available in the communities that we serve. Um, if you Look to Cuba, um, even though we 
it's going to get harder and harder to go there. But if you look to Cuba, <laughs> um, they, with their urban agriculture program, um, they have more than 300,000 urban farms, and they feed about 50% of their population on the island. Um, so they, along with like um, 30,000 tons of meat and two, two, more than 2 million pounds of eggs, um, Cuban urban farmers yield about 44 pounds of per square foot per year. Um, so to bring it to New York terms, 120, 100, uh, 1,200 acres of land would produce about 88 million pounds of vegetables enough to provide 220 pounds of per year per person to almost 400,000 residents. So that's everybody in Brownsville could eat. Um, so this is why we think it's important. The community's gentrification is happening and it really concentrates the effect of poverty and hunger. Um, even though in a lot of the communities that we serve, the retail landscape has improved, there are more stores, but those stores aren't necessarily selling the things that are familiar to the community and it's become more expensive. So using urban agriculture as a way to serve those communities and it's direct access to the residents of the community. Um, so we just want more development, development, more farm stands and more food box, um, more farm, food, box, food box distributions, more um, farmers markets. Um, I really want to highlight the campaign against hunger in Bed-Stuy as well as um, like all of their programming, um, hiring youth to have summer jobs and jobs throughout the year as well as feeding people. Teens for Food Justice has become a city harvest donor. So it shows that by scalable urban farming, it can really make a difference in serving the underserved, as well as um, the Phoenix Community Garden in Brownsville, I'm sorry, in Ocean Hill, they'll kill me if I say Brownsville, in Ocean Hill. Um, they have a robust mini food hub where they're doing a food box distribution as well as their own farmer's market on, on Saturdays. So um, and we're also really encouraged by, um, we know that the urban farming um, and urban ag tech is it's lucrative and there's lots of money um, that can be thrown at it, but we also want you to take into account that the community needs to be involved in that. So if I'm a, a traditional growing farmer, if I'd like to do hydroponics or aquaponics, there should be funding and training and technical assistance and they're full afforded for that. Um, so as our ads say, we really need your help in helping us to feed New York or we're really encouraged by the recent, um, um, when thinking about rezoning, um, when it comes to and its effect on food security, we're really encouraged um, by the recent deep dive with the Department of Health and Department of City Planning um, and them looking at the, the effects of zoning on um, food security. So we just, right. sorry thank he's you. not here to hear that. But. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you. Great. I have to ask everyone to stay, stay to the clock only because of the time limit we have with, with the room. Yeah. But I appreciate the testimony. Can you turn it on for her? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Um, my name is Gemma Garcia, and um, I'm, on, I'm here on behalf of East New York Farms. I am testifying in support of Bill 1058 by Council Espinel. Um, East New York Farms has been working for over 20 years to improve food access and build community through local food production. More than a single urban farm, we are, we are a community of a hundred, hundreds of gardeners, vendors, educators, youth, NYCHA residents, and neighbors who have transformed our neighborhood. We applaud the effort to bring a more comprehensive approach to securing and advancing urban agriculture in New York City. To do our work effectively, we need to partner with a variety of city agencies which underscores the need for more coordination on a government level. In this year alone, we have forged partnerships and signed agreements with Green Thumb, NYCHA, Department of Sanitation, Department of Transportation, Department of Health, CUNY, and the Office of Environmental Remediation. The breadth of this, these partnerships alone should be enough to convey the degree to which our work intersects with city policy initiatives on many different fronts. We, have, we are excited to see urban agriculture expand to all sectors of the city and to serve a wider community, be that through gardens, urban farms, hydroponics, or roof farms. At the same time, we insist that any urban 
agriculture plan must take into account the critical role that community gardeners play in this city, of which I'm one. The majority of food production in this city happens in over 500 community gardens, many of them in low-income communities of color in the Bronx, Upper Manhattan, and Brooklyn. In addition to providing fresh produce for families, many gardens also supply farmers market. In fact, gardeners in East New York were the first urban growers in New York State who were certified to accept the Farmer's Market Nutrition Program coupons, which serve seniors and mothers who receive WIC. Any planning process for the Department of City Planning must incorporate the voice of low-income communities of color and must keep equity as a central focus in the process. As East New York residents, we have been disappointed in the past for the approach of DCP when it came to rezoning our community. We hope that they can do better in this process by engaging community stakeholders from the beginning. Beyond a comprehensive urban agriculture plan, we would like to see this bill create an interagency task force <laughs> whose mission is to protect, foster, and expand urban agriculture in New York City. The needs of the urban agriculture community are as diverse as the practitioners and the issues, and the issues have shifted over time and will continue to evolve. We want to see a coordinate, coordinated effort by city agencies, including parks, HPD, DEP, sanitation, and others, to support the urban agriculture community and leverage of city resources for community benefit. Th thank you. I'm gonna have to uh, move on to the next panelist, Are but I appreciate sure? it. If you have a testimony, you can give it, uh, give it in to us and, and we'll finish reading it. Yes, right. okay, thank, thank you. you. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you for holding this hearing. My name is Onika Abraham. I am a lot of things, a wife, a mother, a native, Lori Sider, uh, who was deeply impressed, impressioned by um, community gardens throughout my youth. I'm also the director of Farm School NYC. And in that role, I uh, really want to um, say that we are excited about the energy behind this comprehensive plan. Urban agriculture is something that's been the bedrock of food justice and food sovereignty for generations of urban poor because we can do it. Uh, we have a few seeds, the sun, the rain, the soil, and that's all we really need. Um, we have the control of what we eat by what we grow, and we also have the means of the production and distribution, which is critical. This is something that the founders of Farm School NYC understood deeply. Farm School NYC's origin story provides a really important example of the importance of building community voice into this proposed urban prag uh, agricultural plan. Farm School was created by a collective of farmers, educators, social justice advocates, working and living in low-income communities in New York City. Our communities are so often defined by what we lack, lack of access to fresh food and healthcare, economic and educational opportunity. But our founders were really focused on the abundant resources that they shared. Over 600, 900, 1,000 community gardens in the city, depending on how you count. Um, experienced growers with expertise to share, um, like the sister sitting right next to me, community gardeners throughout the city. Our founders recognized the need for a comprehensive professional level of farmer training program for adults, so they started one. Together, they centered the school on social justice, believing that farming and community can be a tool for liberation and self-determination for the marginalized and the oppressed. And they really developed um, all of our teaching methodology on labor movements, um, really welcoming in communities that have been underserved by traditional hierarchical educational institutions. So when we welcomed our first class in 2010, since then, we've trained more than 400 people who are now leading farms and gardens in the city. I think what's really important to lift up in this conversation are the people who are going to be leading these farms to the futures, the adults who are doing all of this work in the city, mostly unpaid, often underpaid. How are we supporting working wages for farm labor in the city and in our food region in general? And how are we creating opportunities for people to have that self-determination to really invest in their entrepreneurial spirit and not keep depending on low wage and free wage work in the city to run all of the gardens that we're really working on right now. Thank you. You have the full testimony. That's a lot more points in it. I appreciate it.
Thank you very much, Councilman, for all of your environmental progressiveness. My name is Alessandro Ciari. I come from the CUNY Urban Food Policy Institute. And my points are urban agriculture is beginning to contribute to environmental goals by sequestering storm water to resilience by stemming flooding and to, ec to economic growth through job training and entrepreneurship. An urban agriculture plan would identify ways to increase the co-benefits that farms and gardens produce. Conflicts between ab urban agriculture and competing land uses continue, highlighting the value of a, of a public planning process to decide how much urban agriculture is appropriate for New York City. Where new urban farms and gardens should be located, methods to protect existing gardens and farms, and a process for supporting the current and new farming and gardening activities. New forms of commercial urban agriculture practiced indoors in shipping containers on rooftops require reassessing zoning and related codes and regulations to ensure that these innovations are supported while also protecting community health, safety, and quality of life with fair wages and working conditions for farm workers. Efforts to sustain regional agriculture, particularly in the Hudson Valley, have created opportunities for innovative links between peri-urban and urban farms. Incorporating regional agriculture in the urban agriculture plan would identify common needs and opportunities for shared infrastructure and supportive policy. Officials from the Parks Department and Recreation, and recreation have said, and, uh, and, of city and the Department of City Planning, have said that a plan is unnecessary because the city's zoning allows urban agriculture throughout the five boroughs in some cases, and there are no significant zoning or regulatory obstacles to growing food in the city. But there are many questions about expanding urban agriculture that a plan could answer. Number one, how much land should be allocated for this activity? Number two, to what extent are existing resources searching as green thumb is as green thumb adequate for an expanding urban agriculture sector? Number three, how can urban farms use resources like water and soil sustainably and economically? And number four, how can urban farms and gardens be designed to address large issues like climate resilience and social equity? Plans are meant for, to envision and guide a future. A plan would help to make urban agriculture bigger, stronger, more sustainable, and more democratic. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I appreciate all your testimony. I look forward to uh, reading the rest of it, but it was all insightful. Uh, and I, I'm hoping that we, we're, we're going to get this done. Um, but I want to follow up our conversation, making sure that all our points are addressed in this bill moving forward. All right. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. We'll call up the last panel. Wiley Goodman, Kristen Reynolds, and Jordan Rogers. Um, should I wait till folks sit or can I start? Yeah, you can yeah, begin. Great. Um, good afternoon. My name is Wiley Goodman. I'm an urban planner from Ridgewood, Queens, and the lead author of a recently published article in the journal Land Use Policy, Will the Urban Agriculture Revolution Be Vertical and Soilless? A Case Study of Controlled Environment Agriculture in New York City. I'm here today to urge support for Councilmember Espinal's proposed legislation to create a comprehensive urban agriculture plan for New York City. If passed, the plan would put New York on par with U.S. Mun municipalities such as Los Angeles, Chicago, and Boston, among others, in prioritizing agriculture as a land use not merely compatible with urban life, but enhancing of it. Agriculture may seem antithetical to New York's densely built environment, but as anyone who has visited our 550 community gardens, 30 plus educational farms, 10 and growing for-profit rooftop and indoor uh, establishments, and six NYCHA farms knows, determination to plant and harvest and distribute has grown steadily in the last decade and appears poised for continued expansion. Why then is a comprehensive UA plan needed? Because even as interest in agriculture has risen, community-based farmers, particularly farmers of color, are still constricted in their ability to engage in safe and sustainable production due to lack of resources and information. 
In parallel, over one million food challenged New Yorkers most in need of agricultural, sociocultural, health, environmental, and economic benefits remain far from fully accessing these eco-services. And while commercial agriculture is encouraged in nearly every zoning district, financial, legal, and land use obstacles reduce the degree to which entrepreneurs can comfortably consider New York as a viable location to build their businesses. In sum, a comprehensive UA plan could address these barriers, ensuring that more of those who want to farm can do so successfully. How would the plan accomplish this? By bringing together diverse stakeholders and city agencies to formulate shared goals, determine targeted strategies, and unlike many cities, measure whether objectives are achieved. In this, New York can benefit from both studying these cities' experiences and bringing to the process the innovative spirit synonymous with New York. Which, <laughs> Um, which is why I want to leave you this morning with this recommendation, not if, uh, not when, not if the bill passes, we use our imaginations to envision a biophilic future for New York in which nature is interwoven into the landscape of infrastructure, et cetera. The 21st century New York could include everything from kelp harvesting in the East River to cricket production in once abandoned factories and beyond. If we plan for that eventuality, New York can reassert its position as an urban agriculture leader, and more importantly, prepare the city's 1.1 million uh, students for careers in a regional economy where the broad range of food, agriculture, natural resource, and human science professions stand to play a critical role in our green new future. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> thank you. Um, thank you, Council Councilmember Espinal, and for the rest of the committee for allowing me to testimony today. Uh, my name is Kristen Reynolds. I'm a resident of Forest Hills and a co-author of two recent studies on urban agriculture in New York City, one of which has been referenced today, Five Borough Farm, which documented urban agriculture throughout the city, recommended policy changes and suggestions to strengthen the practice throughout the five boroughs. And the second, Beyond the Kale, which documents the uh, work of people of color and women in particular in low-income com communities using urban agriculture to advance social equity. I'm currently conducting research on commercial urban agriculture in Paris and New York and attendant policy changes. Um, I want to speak briefly about this today and you'll have my full testimony which I've submitted. Um, commercial and high-tech urban agriculture are an evolution in both cities, New York and Paris, and policies are responding to these changes. This is logical, particularly in the United States, given that agriculture defined at the federal level by the USDA um, is a commercial activity. But this has potential ramifications on the diversity of urban agriculture and its potential to provide social, ecological, economic, and community benefits for all city residents. Today I'd like to share a few brief points about these evolutions, but I'll skip through them quickly because of the lack of time. Um, a recent assessment estimated the potential economic value of ecosystem services, including food production from urban agriculture, uh, globally between 88 and 164 billion dollars. Um, and if investment in high-tech urban agriculture suggest profitability, there's at least an expectation that commercial urban agriculture will produce strong economic returns. And I will uh, defer to the rest of my written testimony and close by offering a two points that I think are important um, if and when the plan, planning process goes forward. Two things that would strengthen the integrity of a com comprehensive urban agriculture plan for New York City in the context of the recent evolutions in commercial urban agriculture are that it enables and um, that the plan supports a diverse system that enables uh, to support the needs of all and needs and preferences of all New Yorkers and all community gardeners. And second, due to the diversity of interests represented in New York City urban agriculture, which I and others have documented in detail and many others know from experience, the, should, the city should formally engage informed and experienced individuals and community members of the commu uh, in developing the con comprehensive urban agriculture plan. New York has a rich and diverse her history of urban agriculture, one that's regarded around the world as a model for innovative farming and gardening. A comprehensive urban agriculture plan should live up to this reputation, making New York City a model for just and sustainable urban agriculture policy making in the 21st century. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jordan. I am the F-16 pilot at the New Jersey Air National Guard. I do that guy's job. So I guess I'm the governor then, or like, how does this work? <laughs> I mean, I'm the one that protects his sovereignty, right? I mean, whenever you're doing that job, usually that's the guy who's in charge, right? Not necessarily? Okay, I just want to make sure we're clear on this because it just, just doesn't look right. Um, just a couple of weeks ago, I submitted a bill and it was approved called the Green New Deal. 
identify yourself for the record? Yeah, Jordan Rogers. Jordan Rogers. Yes. Um, yeah, I'm the, I'm the F-16 pilot. Um, so my question to you is, I, I submitted the, have you heard of the Green New Deal? You know that, yeah, I wrote that. And uh, I was, it was supposed to be on my contract, um, but one of the state senators here that, that received it, uh, I think it was Bernie Sanders, uh, wrote his name on it <laughs> and um, submitted it. Uh, and so they, the president yeah, right, told me yeah, to right, resubmit it. Do you have anything to say regarding the hearing today, regarding the urban urban? Yes, farmers? and um, it is regarding this specifically because uh, a part of that Green New Deal was not properly placed, and so the president told me to come down here and resubmit a new version that actually was a lot better. Um, and it also entailed distributing the rice attacks on farmlands to the soldiers who actually fought for it. And since we're the ones that uphold it, I think that it should go to them. And, um, you know, if they do grants for, you know, no money down payments on home loans, I don't see why they can't just give them the rice attacks on farmland. You know, we got the National Guard down there and they're not being used, so might as well give, you know, some rice attacks to them. I mean, it, that is technically what we fought for, right? And what we defend here, your rice attacks. So, I mean, it should go to them too. Okay, so you're saying farmland for, for veterans. Right, yeah, I mean, we provide a protective service to the community that they're taxing, and I mean, without the, the landlord, the farm operates just fine. Um, so, you know, might as well get some protective services Got to it. the community that we're taxing. All right, thank you, sir. Thanks for your testimony. Yeah, sure thank thing. You. Okay. Um, one what more quick question. If I wanted to submit a new bill, would this be the right place to do this for as well? They told me to come to a committee, but I'm not sure if I'm in the right place. Well, um, th this is more of a, a city issue. Uh, it, it sounded sound like you were alluding to a, a federal bill you were working on. Right, but so they told me that I had to speak to some committee. Wait, sure af that. After the hearing, um, just without. leave us your information, and we'll reach out to you by email. That'd be great. Call. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, with that said, this, this hearing uh, is, is adjourned. Um, we are going to take all of the testimony into account to see uh, how we, 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 we work this bill, but as I mentioned earlier, we have over 40 co-sponsors. Uh, I hope to get this thing passed this time around, um, and the sooner the better. So thank you. With that, the meeting's adjourned.